Today, fast trains thunder across the railway bridge at Nimi, just outside the Belgian city of Mons. But more than a century ago, in August 1914, this was the place where the British army went to war. As this episode marks the end of season two of the podcast, I wanted to have a season roundup, really, to look back at some of the things that we've done and also look forward to some of the plans that I have for the podcast as we move towards season three. It's been a a very enjoyable season for me, and I want to thank you all for your support by listening to and downloading the podcast. We've gone through some incredible milestones with the podcast. On the 1st of July, we passed a quarter of a million downloads. And since then, which is only about six and a bit weeks away, we've had another 40,000 downloads. So by the time this episode goes out, we'll be close on 300,000. And that, to me, is really quite incredible, way beyond anything that I thought when I first started this podcast last March. Over the course of this season, we've walked the Western Front from Flanders to the Somme and as far down as the Champagne. I've tried to look at some diverse subjects. Recently, we talked about behind the lines, not on the front line itself, but the area behind the front line, which was just as important to the history of the Great War. And it was good to introduce books and battlefields into the podcast with a look at a particular area of the Somme through the eyes of three Great War authors. And that's something I'll return to in the upcoming season of The Old Front Line. One of our most popular episodes was the episode looking at the film 1917. Now, this film seems to be something that you either love or hate. But what I wanted to do in that episode was to challenge some of the myths surrounding it, that the history in it was somehow wrong. And it was really good to see people's reaction to that. So we'll probably look at doing that again for some other films connected to the Great War. And we've got some upcoming ones uh, soon as well. There's a new version of All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, by the look of it, a, a black and white version in German coming up. That's quite interesting. And there's a new film looking at the Battle of Messines from the viewpoint of the tunnelling companies of the Royal Engineers. So film and the war is something we'll probably have a few episodes on going forward. I've also been lucky to have been joined by some fantastic guests with our trench chats in this season. We've had some excellent contributions on the interwar battlefield tourism period from Amy Harrison. It was great to get that insight into Canadian remembrance tourism from Samantha Cowan. And also wonderful to have our old friend Peter Doyle, Professor Peter Doyle, back on the podcast talking about his new book on the Princess Mary's Tim, which is, as I record this, by the looks of it, is about to come out. And those of you that have supported it via Kickstarter should be getting your copies fairly soon. And I think having guests on the podcasts uh, on an occasional basis really does add something to what we do here because we get some quite diverse subjects. So on the one hand, Tim Godden, who is a great supporter of the podcast and his work on the design of the cemetery is something that I hope he will put into a book himself one day. That's one in-depth look at a particular aspect of the war. And then on the other end of the scale, in some degrees, was Richard Fisher's work on the machine gun corps and the insight into the use of the Vickers machine gun and the role of the Corps in the First World War. So again, as we move forward, we'll probably be having some of these people back on again to talk about their ongoing aspects of the research that they do, but also some new guests to talk about different aspects of the war as well. Another milestone in the podcast as we move forward with the things that we'll do via the old front line was the first supporters talk that I gave to those of you who support the podcast via Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon. This was a way of saying thank you to those of you who do this and also talk about some of the plans that we have for the future. And one thing that I always want to emphasise with the podcast, and this was a founding principle of it, is that it will always, always be free. You'll never have to pay to download and listen to the podcast. If you want to support it via those methods, via Buy Me A Coffee or Patreon, you can do so, but I'll never oblige you to do that. It's entirely your choice. 
but I wanted to thank those of you who do, and the talk was a way of doing that. So I gave the talk to the supporters. We had that online for a little while. Those of you who couldn't make the live talk, I then uploaded it onto YouTube, um, hid it away, and then made it available to those on those two platforms to, to watch again. And after a little while, once they'd all had a chance to have a look at it, I then made it public. And that's probably something that I'll continue to do with some of the video content as we go forward. Now, the podcast will continue. We are all gradually returning to work, and myself included. And there will be pressures of work, but of course, my work is pretty much wound into the battlefields anyway. But I do intend to continue to produce it on a regular basis, hopefully a weekly basis, but certainly on a regular basis as we go forward. But I want to expand it a little bit as well to produce some additional material, video content, because a lot of what we do with the podcast in some respects is quite visual. I try to paint the scene for you as we walk these battlefields together, knowing that some of you have been there, but many of you have not. But what would be quite good to do to go along with the podcast episodes and not really replicate the podcast, but to provide supplementary additional supporting material in the form of video. So some video walks across the landscape and also use some contemporary film to highlight particular aspects of the First World War. So I've got some upcoming videos looking at aspects of trench warfare, artillery in the First World War, gas in the First World War, and so on. And this is a way of connecting this all up to what we discuss in different episodes of the podcast. Now to get that going, the video side of it, I really obviously need to be back on the battlefields. And gradually, the ability to travel within Europe is beginning again. It's not exactly easy, but it's getting better. And hopefully that'll improve over the course of the next few months. And I'll be able to get over there and record some material. But also going forward, something that I discussed with the supporters in the supporter talk was the idea of an old frontline community. Because we are all bound together with an interest in the Great War, in the First World War history, and our connection, whether virtual or in reality, to the battlefields of that war. We feel passionately about them, and we want to be invested in them in, in various ways, whether that's visiting them, protecting them, researching them, whatever. And I think that we've probably almost built a mini community around these battlefields in the way that it does connect us, and that's something that I want to try and move forward. And, and I'm not 100% sure myself as to actually how we do that. We've got quite a good way of communicating with each other through social media, through the Twitter feed, through Facebook pages, and through the email and so on on, on the actual website itself. But perhaps at some points, when we can all easily travel again, we'll have some sort of meet-up on the battlefields of the Great War and do a walk together. Perhaps there'll be an old frontline battlefield tour further down the line. These are all things that I'm considering, but I would very much welcome anyone's input on this. If you've got an idea as to how we could drive this forward, how to move it forward, and the sort of things that you want to do, we could, for example, have a Zoom meeting uh, on an irregular basis where we get together and we all have a chat about the First World War. That's something that could easily be hosted as part of this community building idea going forward. So do get in touch with me about that. So this is the end of season two. There's going to be a couple of weeks off and we will return with season three at the beginning of September. We're going to continue as part of that month with the 105th anniversary of the Somme by dipping into particular aspects of the Somme campaign as it moved forward 105 years ago and there will be a, an additional bonus episode in September looking at the Battle of Fleurs Corselet on the 15th of September on the anniversary of that attack, an attack of course associated with my old village of Corselet and no doubt that will come into it. So season three back in September, for now we're going to head off to Belgium and look at the very beginning of the war and the opening shots near a small bridge at Nimi. This episode of the podcast goes live on the 21st of August, and on this day in 1914, 
a soldier of the 4th Battalion of the Middlesex Regiment on service with the British Expeditionary Force, was allegedly killed in action. That was John Henry Parr. And I say allegedly because there is some dispute as to whether he really was the first British soldier to die, as he's often described as. His story has come back into sharp focus again because his 1914 star, his Mon Star and Bar, is about to be sold in an online auction. The estimate is about £2,000, and I suspect it will probably go for a lot more than that because he is widely accepted as that first British casualty of the Great War on the Western Front, often, in fact, described as the first British casualty of the war, but that in itself is not true. He's buried in San Symphorium Cemetery at Mons, directly opposite George Ellison, who was the last British soldier to die with the Fifth Lancers at Mons on the 11th of November 1918. And there is that great symmetry, really, of the first and the last being buried opposite each other, and that connection, that small strip of land that separates those two graves, four years of war and a million war dead between them. Now, Andrew Thornton, who we had as a guest on the podcast in Season 1, has done some extensive research on Parr, and it really does challenge what we believe happened to him and whether that date of his death, the 21st of August, is correct or not. And I'm going to put a link on the podcast website to Andrew's research because I think it's very, very important, this type of research, challenging these myths, getting deep into the documents and the story and looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes. But whatever the results of Andrew's research, there's no doubt there will be a great deal of interest surrounding the sale of this medal. I've seen a school in Belgium, not far from where Parr is buried at San Symphorium, raising money to buy the medal because they discuss his story as part of their education. And you can see what attracts people to it. He was a teenage Tommy. He joined the regular army, uh, a Londoner, and been killed in the early engagement of the BEF, whether the first casualty or amongst its first casualties. In many respects, with a lot of these early deaths, we'll never be entirely sure. And when I first visited Parr's grave at San Symphorium, probably back in the late 80s, his headstone had been changed. It was the original headstone, or seemingly the original headstone, and the date had been cut out. It originally supposedly said the 23rd of August, which was the day of the Battle of Mons, and that had been changed to the 21st. The historian Rose Coombs was involved in this, but... It's interesting to see some of the documents that Andrew Thornton has uncovered into how this date was amended several times over the years. And like I say, it's really worth reading Andrew's account. So do check out that link on the podcast website. But the renewed interest in Parr and the sale of this medal gives us an opportunity to go back to that early period of the Great War on the Western Front and the British Army's involvement in it and to discuss, for the first time on this podcast, some of the fighting at Mons. Mons is a small battlefield, but really big enough to be too big to cover in one entire episode. So what I'm intending to do is to look at different aspects of the fighting at Mons. And we're going to start with one particular sector of the Mons battlefield on the 23rd of August 1914, and that's just outside the little village of Nimi, close to the Mons Condé Canal. And that's where we'll begin. The British army that went to war in 1914 was a regular army. So what that meant was that it was not a conscription army. It was not made up of conscripts. There was no universal service in Britain before the Great War. So that meant that every man was a volunteer. And this has been the case in the British Army over many, many decades, long before 1914. The men who joined the regular army tended to be from the lower echelons of British society. A century before the Great War, that well-known British commander Wellington had described his men as the scum of the earth, not in a disparaging way, but with admiration. He knew that these men were from the tougher corners of Britain. And a hundred years later, in the approach to 1914, this was still the type of man that generally would step forward and enlist in the regular army. 
Britain was a very different community before 1914, with low amounts of employment at certain periods in what is often perceived to be a golden Edwardian era, men had little choice but to seek work in any way they could, and many, including many of my own family members, joined the regular army because of this. They were agricultural workers, and employment on the land dipped in that period before the war, and they marched up the roads to the local depot and joined their local regiment. This was not an uncommon thing. And when you step forward like this to join the regular army, you join for a period of 12 years, normally separated by what was called seven and five. Seven years as a regular soldier, five on the reserve. Although that did vary with certain regiments, for example with the guards there was a connection between joining the guards and entering the police force, so you did a minimum period of service in the army and then went on to the reserve and went straight in to become a police officer. Having joined the army, you did a period of basic training, and then gradually the army encouraged you to do more and more training. And this meant that within the British army, it was arguably amongst the most highly trained army in Europe when Europe went to war in 1914. Being a, a regular volunteer army, you couldn't force men to do things. You had to give them a carrot, and the carrot was pay, proficiency pay. The more you did, the better you were at your job, the better soldier you were, whether it was marksman or sapper or transport driver, the more money the army gave you. And that meant more money for the wet canteen, for beer, and more money for a tart in the back streets of Aldershot. We've got to remember that this was not an army of choir boys. It was drawn from that rough end of British society. And this is what motivated many of the men who joined it. And while this British army was tough, was highly trained, it was also small, small in comparison to the vast European armies built on conscription. So the British army in 1914, when it went to war, was able to put about 120,000 men initially into the field. It had planned to take six infantry divisions and one cavalry division as part of a British expeditionary force in case of any European war. In the end, two of those divisions were held back, so initially, in the lead-up to the Battle of Mons, only four divisions of about 20,000 men each were dispatched across the Channel to France. By the close of the 1914 campaign, and the dates on the Mons Star, like Pars, which is being sold this week, are the 5th of August, when the first troops arrived, to the 22nd of November 1914, the conclusion of the fighting after the First Battle of Ypres. And by that stage... About 275,000 men were awarded the 1914 star, most of them regulars, but by the tail end of the First Battle of Ypres, a large number of men from the territorial force, territorial soldiers, had also arrived to take part in the campaign. So again, what this does, that number, 275,000, it gives us this insight into just how small the British Army was in 1914 compared to the millions of men available to nations like France and Germany. So when Britain declared war on the 4th of August 1914, the plan to mobilise the army and put it into the field was put into place straight away. That date of the 5th of August when the first men arrived, that wasn't infantry or cavalry, these were men from the Army Service Corps and the Royal Engineers going across to Le Havre and near to the city of Rouen to establish a base for the army that would follow. And then infantry brigades with battalions within them and cavalry and artillery and field companies and field ambulances and everything else would arrive. And in the lead up to the Battle of Mons on the 23rd of August 1914, the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, assembled and began to move up to a pre-arranged point to be on the flank of the French army. This was a plan that had been established before the war. But events were moving very, very rapidly, and quickly that was abandoned. The Germans were sweeping their way through Belgium as part of the Schlieffen Plan. Britain had gone to war to defend Belgian neutrality, and the British Army began to move up towards the Belgian border to take part in the fighting there, to try and stem the steamroller advance of the German army as it headed towards Paris as part of that Schlieffen Plan. In terms of how the BEF at this stage was organised, at the top was the Commander-in-Chief, Sir John French. He was the commander of the British forces when we went to war in 1914. 
Beneath him, the British Expeditionary Force, those divisions and cavalry, were split between two army corps. So it's like a family tree. The BEF at the top, it's two branches at this stage, the 1st and 2nd Corps, commanded by General Sir Douglas Haig, General Smith Dorian. They were the next step down in terms of the command on the battlefield, and beneath those two officers were infantry divisions with cavalry and all the supporting troops. After Mons, more troops arrived. General Snow's 4th Division, for example, came just after the Battle of Mons and would go to Smith Dorian's corps to take part in the fighting at Le Cateau. It was an army that relied on moving up on foot. It could use and did use the railway systems within France. Men moved up to locations close to the Belgian border and detrained there and then marched up. There wasn't sufficient motor transport to move men around at this stage of the conflict. So it meant that the army could easily become spread out and with no clear method of direct communication between units, cohesion, keeping these men together, was a difficult task and frustrated commanders in that early period of the war. But with all this talk of armies and corps and divisions, it's difficult to get lost in that terminology. And I think always on battlefields, it's wise to concentrate sometimes on a, a specific unit to try and get some context of what fighting in August 1914 was like. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to look at one battalion involved in one part of the Battle of Mons, the 4th Battalion, the Royal Fusiliers, at Nimi, just outside Mons itself. On the outbreak of war in August 1914, the 4th Battalion Royal Fusiliers were stationed at Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight. They were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel McMahon DSO. He was a career soldier who had fought in India and the Boer War and had been decorated for his bravery with the Distinguished Service Order. They were mobilised on the outbreak of war as every infantry battalion in the British Army was and they were then embodied with 734 reservists. Now what did this mean? Well, if you had soldiers joining for periods of seven and five, seven years as a regular soldier, full-time soldier, career soldier, and then going for five years on the reserve, so leaving the army and going into civvy street, civilian life, and pursuing a civilian occupation, it meant that at any given time in any unit of the British Army, numbers were actually quite low, peacetime numbers on the establishment of a unit serving in Britain were quite low. And to bring that battalion back up to full strength, an infantry battalion like the 4th Royal Fusiliers would be about 1,100 officers and men. So if they took on 734 reservists to make up their strength, it shows you that the battalion was only mustering about 400 or so men in its peacetime service on Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight. Now, as a reservist, you could extend your period on the reserve because the army gave you a payment. You had to do some regular drill sessions, but you could continue to go about your regular civilian life and occupation. And many men saw it as essentially free money. If you stayed on the reserve, the army would pay you and you could carry on being paid in your civilian job. The catch was, of course, that if there was a war, you would be recalled to the colours, recalled to the army. And this is exactly what happened in 1914. So some of these reservists coming back into the Fusiliers would have been men who perhaps only left a short time before, who had done their seven years, for example, and then gone on to the reserve. Others could be men who had been away from the army for five years nearly, others a lot longer than five years. So this meant that their fitness level, their training level and everything else was nothing like the men who were full-time regular soldiers, the men who had been at Parkhurst when the war broke out. So this was one of the issues with how the British Army went to war in 1914. So after getting the battalion onto a war footing, issuing the reservists with fresh equipment, boots, uniforms, webbing and their weapons, the battalion assembled and sailed for Le Havre on the 13th of August 1914 and then went straight into one of the rest camps that had been built by the initial troops of the BEF just outside the town of Harfleur. 
it was a very hot summer, the summer of 1914. And in one of the very earliest marches, 97 reservists fell out because of this. And again, this would be something that would hamper quite a few units in the campaign of 1914 because these reservists, unused to the level of fitness required to march great distances and being issued with brand new boots that were ill-fitting, created a lot of problems. So men fell out with bad feet, swollen feet and feet damaged by the rub of the boots as they marched along these cobbled roads of France and Belgium. And when you read, jumping on a little bit from beyond to beyond Mons, you read about the retreat from Mons where they marched 200 miles from Mons to the Marne in the retreat, the great retreat, then hundreds of men fall out during that period with wagons going along, picking these guys up to bring them to join the battalion further down the line. The 4th Royal Fusiliers then boarded a train. They moved into the boxcars, the, the wagons that had 40 men or eight horses painted in French on the side of it. A lot more than 40 men were crammed into each. And the train crept along the tracks of Normandy into the Somme via Amiens up into northeastern France to Londresses, a town close to a canal system and with a railhead and they detrained there and began to march up to the border. In doing so, they crossed some battlefields from older parts of British military history. Men within their brigades slept for the night close to the battlefield of Malplaquet, for example. And then orders came to cross into Belgium, and they moved up towards another canal, the Mons Condé Canal, which was described as the line of resistance. They had specific orders when they got there to not destroy the bridges and troops went beyond the canal into the villages above Mons to set up a, essentially a, a skirmish line to await the arrival of the Germans. It wasn't clear at this particular point exactly where the Germans were but that soon became apparent. And the Royal Fusiliers then found themselves along the canal defending this ground. The battalion at this particular point numbered 26 officers and 983 men. Lieutenant Colonel McMahon decided to put two companies up and hold two companies back and he found himself moving into the village of Nimi just outside Mons in this coal mining region of Belgium and establishing his positions along that canal. The companies within the Royal Fusiliers, it was one of these regiments that didn't use A, B, C and D company, it used W, X, Y and Z. Quite a few regiments of the army did this and the two companies involved in the fight at Mons at Nimi, Y Company was at the Nimi railway bridge. Here Captain Forster placed two platoons along the canal itself, about a hundred men, and then two platoons and company headquarters at the railway bridge itself, so probably just over a hundred men because they had the battalion machine gun section under the command of Lieutenant Morris Deese attached to them at this particular point. Z Company was to their left at a position known as Lock Number 6. They were on the left flank. The canal curved and went back towards Mons itself at this particular point. And when we look at this part of the battlefield, and particularly for those of you listening to this who have been there now, what we see today is very different to what was there in 1914. There were two bridges on the 4th Royal Fusiliers front. The railway bridge, which had obviously a railway track, crossing that section of the canal. Today it's a big steel girder bridge, a box bridge in some respects, but then it was a low parapet stone bridge, very very different to what we see today. And the other bridge on their right was a swing bridge. So this was a bridge that opened up to allow the passage of barges along the canal and so when the bridge was closed to traffic, road traffic, it was out in the middle of the canal. And this is what the probably the pioneers of the 4th Royal Fusiliers did. They went out, they put the bridge so that it was open to barge traffic, but effectively closed that road to stop the Germans from flooding across it. On the railway bridge, they put some barbed wire on what was essentially the German side, the other side of the canal, to stop troops getting up onto the railway line and initially crossing the bridge. There was a factory close by where some accounts talk of them getting big 
cable drums out of the of the factory and then rolling them up onto the railway embankment pushing them along the track and then tipping them over to create some further barricades on the bridge itself and then slit trenches were dug along the canal the canal today is much much wider than the canal as it was in 1914 this is a, a belgian super canal in some respects and in the 70s and 80s there was a lot of work that went on here that forever changed this part of the of the battlefield from what it had looked like in 1914 so when we come here today we see very little here at Nimi of what it was like the, the actual town of Nimi the village of Nimi itself is pretty much the same you go past the town hall for example to get down to where the Nimi railway bridge is located that building is the original building that was there in 1914 but this next bit where the canal is and the bridge is very different the pivot bridge the swing bridge was on the right flank of the fusiliers that is now a modern concrete road bridge and the railway bridge built to carry much bigger trains and in 1914 is this big box girder bridge and these bridges generally at Mons have had a bit of a checkered history not destroyed in 1914 could well have been destroyed in 1918 when the Germans pulled back through here, but certainly blown at the beginning of the Second World War in 1940, and with the Battle of the Mons Pocket in 1944, likely many, if not all of these bridges, were blown again by the Germans. So if you worked in bridge construction in this part of Belgium, you'd have had uh, a lot of work to do in the half century between the Great War and the end of the Second World War. Now, this battlefield and this story of the 4th Royal Fusiliers was depicted in one of the BBC centenary films of Our World War, which was a three-part series looking at different aspects of the war, and they covered the story of the Fusiliers at this particular point. And the bridge that they chose to film at in the UK, not overseas, was a bridge that looks like the modern bridge rather than the bridge that was actually here in 1914 and i'll put a picture of that original bridge onto the podcast website so you can have a look at it see what it was like now a discussion of our world war and the episode in particular the episode at mons is probably a podcast in its own right and i know as i mentioned andrew thornton earlier in this podcast and his work on par and other aspects of the BEF in 1914 this episode i know is a bit of a, a bugbear for historians like andrew and I have my own problems with it, for sure. But it was interesting to see how many people it did engage. That series as a whole got incredibly high viewing figures. It's just a shame that they didn't pay more attention to some of the aspects of the history. But anyway, that's a story for another day. So with the defences placed in the positions around Nimi and the bridges such as they were, the preparation for battle soon turned to battle itself. And this is the description from the history of the Royal Fusiliers of the opening moments of the engagement. It was a body of very weary men who met the Germans on the morning of the 23rd of August, for many of them had been working practically all night. The Germans could be heard moving about in the woods north of the canal in the dark, and early in the morning a cavalry patrol, consisting of an officer and about six men, suddenly appeared on the Nimi Road, they galloped straight towards the bridge, which was swung round, making an impassable obstacle. The fusiliers opened fire, shot four of the men and wounded the officer. Two of the men were apparently untouched and rode off. The officer, with his horse shot and wounded in the leg, was captured. By a singular irony, it was Lieutenant von Arnim, son of the commander of the 5th German Army Corps. He was wearing his death's head hussar uniform, but the brave show merely threw into high relief the folly of his action. His notebook showed that he had been observing the British position from the edge of the wood, and an aeroplane had been seen making a thorough reconnaissance of the position the night before. But despite this activity, the Germans were in complete ignorance of the dimensions of the force in front of them, and when, at about ten o'clock, they opened the attack, they appeared above the skyline approaching the railway and Nimi bridges in column of route. They are only about a thousand yards distance, and the rapid fire assisted by the battalion's machine guns in a few minutes destroyed their leading sections. The men had never experienced such targets, and they eagerly seized upon the opportunity. The column retired out of view, 
and the position was thoroughly shelled before the advance was resumed in extended order. There was no reply to the German guns, and their fire was particularly galling because of this fact. So the position defended by the 4th Royal Fusiliers held. They were an infantry battalion with only two companies up, facing what were elements of a German infantry regiment, which was probably around about 3,000 men. Not 3,000 directly coming at them at once, but potentially coming in their direction. But men in good defensive positions with a good field of fire and plenty of ammunition could cause merry hell to an advance like this. And the Germans now confronted with a, a river crossing, a canal crossing, directly in the eyes of their enemy, the men of the Fusiliers, then this was going to be a costly engagement for them. So the German artillery played increasingly an important role in this, bombarding the positions around the two bridges. And as the day moved on, the casualties mounted, particularly in the machine gun section, which was in this elevated position up on the railway bank, close to the buttresses of the bridge, and although they were behind some sort of protective position, possibly sandbags, there are no photographs of what the machine gun positions look like at the bridge. There's a lot of artistic license gone into the depiction of this over the years, but it seems logical that you'd prepare some sandbags, which would have been part of battalion stores, to protect your two machine guns, which is what the machine gun section at this stage of the war comprised of, two Maxim machine guns of Boer War vintage rather than Vickers machine guns. You'd use the sandbags to protect them, but whatever, the men were vulnerable to rifle fire, to German machine gun fire, and also German shrapnel being fired from the field guns, which was exploding above their position. So increasingly the men in their slit trenches, and the Fusiliers account talks about digging in here, these were nothing like the trenches of the Western Front. These were probably two or four man positions that were dug by men in the rifle sections to give them some protection. Some men were in some of the, the brick built houses close to the edge of the canal uh, and others dug in along the area of the embankment and the railway track. But gradually casualties mounted and in the machine gun section under the command of Lieutenant Maurice Deese who was from an Anglo-Irish family, a young officer that had been serving in the regiment before the war commanded his machine gun section here and coming under fire he was in the midst of all this inspiring his men to carry on and was wounded himself on several occasions the third wound proving fatal and with the machine gun personnel being diminished by casualties it is said that a call went out for men within the infantry sections who were familiar with the weapons to step forward and assist and one of these it is said was 25 year old private Sid Godley. Now again there's a lot of conflicting information about the story of Sid Godley at Mons. In some accounts he's part of the machine gun section, in other accounts he's in a rifle section but had been trained on the machine gun before the war. This was not uncommon, men were given training in the weapons in case once in battle there were casualties and they needed replacements to take over. But whatever, Sid Godley then found himself with the machine gun or the remaining machine gun firing away until the ammunition was exhausted and the position almost at this stage overrun by the Germans. He too was now wounded and it is said that he picked the machine gun up, smashed it against the bridge and threw it into the canal. Although again there are some conflicting stories of that. On the Fusiliers' right flank, a German soldier named Niemeyer had jumped into the canal, got up onto the swing bridge and put it back into motion, reopening that position. So gradually, in those few hours from the first shots here up to this point, around about midday, and with increasing casualties, it was clear now that the positions held by the 4th Royal Fusiliers here at Nimi were untenable. So at 1.40pm, Lieutenant Colonel McMahon gave the orders for the men to withdraw. And so from there began what was essentially a fighting retreat, pulling back in broad daylight over open ground under direct fire from the enemy and no doubt suffering some casualties along the way. Y Company at the bridge had lost about 75 men killed, wounded and missing and by the time they pulled back the Germans were only 200 yards away. In total the engagement had cost the 4th Royal Fusiliers just over 150 men killed, wounded and missing, of which when we look at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission database, we see that there were 28 dead from the 4th Royal Fusiliers on the 23rd of August 
So these are not catastrophic casualties on the scale of later fighting, even in the first Battle of Eat, when this battalion was pretty much wiped out one way or another. Uh, and then we jump forward to the Somme and its experiences there. These casualties are really quite light in comparison to those later battles. But this was the battalion's first engagement of the war, and these were its first casualties. And Lieutenant Morris Deese had been left behind, believed dead. Sid Godley was missing, and he would become a prisoner of war. And the two of those, Sid Godley and Morris Deese, would become the first two British Army recipients of the Victoria Cross for the fighting on the Western Front during the Great War. On a Ledger battlefield tour to Mons on one occasion some years ago, I had some relatives of Sid Godley on the coach and they spoke to the group about him and, and what sort of man that he was. And they said that while in the army, he had a bit of a, a troubled career, although when we look at his records, there's, there's no particular evidence for this. But certainly they said that when he became a prisoner of war in Germany, he refused to obey the orders of German officers because he didn't consider them proper officers. And for this, he was always getting himself into trouble. And on one occasion, he was called into the camp commandant's office when he actually, for once, had not been getting himself into trouble and was curious as to what this was about. And a notification had come through via the Red Cross that he'd been awarded the Victoria Cross. So he didn't actually receive that award until after the war was over and he came back as a returned prisoner of war. Maurice Deese was dead. His comrade in the machine gun section, the officer commanding it, had not survived his encounter with the Germans at Nimi. And he was buried close by to the battlefield during the war, probably either by Belgian civilians or by the Germans themselves. Then his grave was moved to St Symphorian Cemetery on the outskirts of Mons post-war. He's buried in a separate plot of post-war concentrations in that cemetery, a cemetery that we will return to for an entire episode of the podcast in a future date. Others, like Godley, were wounded and taken prisoner, but some of the wounded were evacuated and taken into the field ambulance and taken down the line for treatment. But for the Royal Fusiliers, typical of many of the battalions that took part in this first British engagement of the Great War, this was their first battle. These were their first casualties. Deese and Godley were the first men to be awarded the Victoria Cross, but others within the battalion were awarded the DSO, the Distinguished Service Order, and also the Distinguished Conduct Medal. And although the military medal did not exist at this stage of the war, when the MM was first instituted in June of 1916, there were retrospective awards amongst it. And I do know of one MM to a soldier of the Royal Fusiliers which seemingly appears to be an award issued for bravery here at Mons in August 1914. So for the Fusiliers and the other men of the BEF, men that would go on to be called Old Contemptibles, this was the first page of their regimental history, the first page of their personal journey across these battlefields and along the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Frontline Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>